Please welcome Dr. Michael Ramsey. So our next speaker uh, is Dr. Michael Stamos. Uh, he's the Dean of UCI Medical School and he's also a colorectal surgeon. And I want to express my really sincere thanks to UCI for allowing us to use this facility. Um, it's, it's first class, it really is, and, uh, but also helping us. And uh, we had the President CEO, Chad Lefteris, on a panel yesterday. We've got the Mike Stamos on today speaking to us. And we have Dr. Joe Carmichael, who's the CMO, uh, on the next panel. And so, plus, we've had volunteers from the medical school and the team here to help us uh, with this event. So we really are most grateful uh, to UCI and Dr. Mike Stamos, thank you so much. And we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Michael Stamos. Good morning. Is the mic working? Yes. Great, great. So welcome back everybody from the break. It was uh, quite a um, um, impressive, uh, in a bad way, uh, talk by uh, Dr. Gabreyes uh, from the World Health Organization. When you think about what we're facing in this country, we have lots of issues, lots of problems. Thankfully, that level of violence within our health care systems doesn't exist. There is, of course, there is violence, and we'll, I, may, I may touch on that later and what we're doing to help that, but, but it's not as big of a problem as it is in, in many places in the world, and that's just sort of mind-numbing to me, so uh, good to you would keep ourselves grounded by hearing that uh, to understand what we can do to help uh, help those situations whenever possible so so let me again welcome everybody to our beautiful UC Irvine campus uh, it's always a pleasure when we're able to host a global conference like this with esteemed colleagues and friends um, and I want to also uh, uh, thank uh, Chad Lefteris our president and CEO of UCI Health uh, my my good friend and colleague and partner uh, he set me up for this talk today by some of his comments yesterday on the panel, actually, because uh, we do uh, talk the same talk and, and walk the same walk. So it's nice to, to have that kind of a, a colleague and, and partner. So today I'm going to talk about how culture drives safety within our system, uh, hoping to impart a few ideas uh, for those of you uh, that might um, be looking for ways to improve the culture, which then improves the safety. Um, and it's really led to our continued growth and success of one of the largest UC academic health systems. Uh, for a brief period of time this year, when we acquired the four hospitals uh, from Tenet, we were the largest system in the UC health system. And then UCSF leapfrogged us by acquiring two hospitals in their area. Uh, but at least on the basis of inpatient beds, we were the largest for a brief period, which is a big change for us, that given that we are uh, the second youngest UC school of medicine and the youngest UC health system. Uh, in the in the system so uh, just not quite 60 years old I want to give you a little bit of background uh, I'd like to share a personal anecdote and then share information on our School of Medicine and on UCI Health Enterprise and I've been the Dean now for eight and a half years uh, and I'm so ingrained in that persona uh, that sometimes I even forget about my almost 30 years of clinical experience I have not uh, had clinical activity for about five years now just the the sheer uh, necessity of the job I'm doing currently uh, doesn't really allow that. Can I first ask how many of you in the audience are physicians? You can raise your hand. Just want to get some sense of the audience. I, I was here yesterday morning, of course. Great. And how many are hospital C-suite members? And I realize it could be both. That's okay. All right. Just a, a small number. That's surprising. Okay, great. So um, from, from my medical school days at, at Case Western Reserve University, uh, in, the, in the early 80s, I entered residency at Jackson Memorial Hospital. Some of you may know that hospital is a very large public county safety net hospital in Miami, Florida. At that time, in the um, late 80s, it was, there was a collapse of the trauma system in South Florida. We were the only level one trauma center for three counties. So to, to say that um, uh, we were busy would be a profound understatement. It had an impact on the entire hospital and, and the healthcare system there. Uh, and, and we um, ultimately led to uh, a sales tax that supported the building of a trauma hospital, uh, which still exists to this day. But at that time, we didn't have that luxury, and we were just overwhelmed with all sorts of um, 
illnesses, but trauma being a, a dominant one. Needless to say, we had no work hour limits, and we typically worked in excess of 110 hours per week plus call. And I'm not at all trying to say I walked through the snow to get to school because I didn't. Uh, well, maybe I did at Case Western, but not in Miami. Uh, but anyway, um, no, it's just really the, it's just what we knew. That's all. It's what we knew. We, we didn't even think to question that. That was just sort of uh, what we were told was the rite of passage. And I, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world because uh, it made me what I am today. And I'm, I'm happy that I had that opportunity. But, but I do think that um, we, we know that we had to make changes and we made changes to not just improve safety, but improve other things as well. Um, but at that time, our main avenue to ensure safety in the hospital environment was really a weekly M&M conference. And those still you know, occur today uh, throughout all of our health systems and hospitals. And we were held accountable for poor outcomes and where the intent was to learn from the mistakes of others. And that did happen to some extent. Uh, um, but uh, it was definitely a malignant environment, uh, especially in a department of surgery. And it created a culture of fear. Uh, again, personally, it prepared me very well for my career. Uh, um, as a dean, I guess, uh, but also as a surgeon. So if we turn now to the UCI School of Medicine, we have 20 clinical departments, over 1,000 clinical faculty, and close to 800 residents and fellows, 500 medical students, all of whom are interacting in the patient environment. On the patient side, our, our UCI Health, not counting our new acquisitions, uh, has well over 1 million outpatient visits, 60,000 emergency department visits, 22,000 annual patient discharges, and over 20,000 inpatient outpatient surgeries. And these numbers continue to grow now that we've added these other hospitals. And as we look to open our acute care hospital at the uh, Irvine location on Jamboree, just down the street here uh, next year. As we've dramatically increased our patient encounters, we've also had to expand our network of physicians, nurses, and support staff. And fortunately, our team was well prepared for this growth with a model that always had culture at the forefront every step of the way. At its core, culture embodies the, you know, the shared values, beliefs, and practices that characterize an organization. And as everyone knows, uh, in healthcare, the culture is integral to fostering an environment where safety is not just a protocol, but a way of life. So when I was asked to speak, I immediately said I wanted to discuss how culture drives safety because it's been top of mind for me for a long time, as has safety. Just parenthetically, when I uh, was um, honored as the president of my national society 10 years ago, my talk uh, for my presidential address was all about safety. And it was all about drawing parallels between the aviation industry and healthcare. Uh, so I'm fully ingrained with that concept, uh, crew resource management, and, and trying to learn from that. Uh, I will say that I think our environment is way more complex uh, than the aviation environment. Even though that is incredibly complex, it's, in my opinion, not even a fraction of the complexity we have uh, uh, because the human body doesn't behave like an airplane. So if you have 300 747s, they all behave the same way. If you have 300 people, they all behave differently, every single one of them. So it makes it much more complex, just my bias. Uh, so over the next 10 minutes, I'll dive into more detail about um, how clinical integration of our enterprise, and, and we use a capital C and a capital I to talk about clinical integration, and I'll explain that in a minute. But the structure we've developed for the enterprise, uh, as well as the impetus for that structure, it didn't happen overnight, and as the saying goes, it took a village to get to where we are now. And as our culture has evolved, that's actually allowed our growth and allowed our evolution as well. So the mission of our school is uh, very simple. Uh, discover, teach, and heal. These three tenets drive us to advance individual and population health across uh, Orange County and beyond through what we think is excellence in research, education, patient care, and, and service. And again, the keystone has been our clinical integration that brings us together as what we call the enterprise. Uh, when I, I joined UCI 22 years ago, but even eight years ago when we started this journey, clinical integration, there was a divide. It was always a, you know, a health system or the medical center and the School of Medicine. And there were people pointing in both directions and accusations on one side that people weren't working hard, people didn't care, all they cared about was the bottom line. There was a lot of that sort of typical, quite frankly, attitude that exists in many academic health systems across the country. Uh, we had a faculty practice plan, we had the School of Medicine, and we had the health system, really. Uh, today, we don't have those distinctions. We just call it the enterprise. And I'll get into what that means and how that's impacted our success and our progress uh, going forward. Um, the, what I think was a forward-thinking integration with the faculty and the health system uh, really uh, was a dyad leadership model was at the forefront of it. And we designed it as a board-like structure uh, we call the Clinical Enterprise Leadership Committee. 
and I'll get into that in a minute, um, but it's basically equal representation from the faculty leadership and from our health system leadership, all reporting up to two people, myself and our CEO, President and CEO, Chad Lefteris, who, by the way, in case you didn't hear this news, was recognized uh, just last week as an academic medical center CEO to know by Becker's Hospital Review. So, so Chad's done lots of great work, and I couldn't be more proud of, uh, of having the chance to work and partner with him. But acting as an enterprise really has allowed our two sides to communicate efficiently and to be more nimble. And I'll get into a minute why we created the structure. The reason we created it was different than the outcome uh, because we didn't imagine we would achieve as much as we have. But as we got into the structure, we started recognizing additional benefits that weren't obvious from the very beginning. But it really has fueled an environment where culture truly drives safety across the enterprise. And I think the outcomes speak for themselves, and I'll share some of those outcomes a little later but it's really improved the culture among physicians and staff. We, we do really feel like a, a team. Uh, it's also created more organizational support and improved quality and safety of care. And as we, as we dove into um, the, uh, the data that really led to the structure that we created, and this is a very simplified model here, but I'll get into it in a minute. But as we dove into it, we first started out just data collection. I'm a big data guy. I believe that most change drives from data and effective change drives from data because people will actually believe it if you have data to back up your assertions as opposed to your emotions. And so relying on data was helpful. And, and there was a belief, you know, eight years ago that we had faculty who weren't working very hard. Uh, and that was because they required subsidy because their collections were low. Well, the truth was they were working very, very hard, but the collections were low because we have 41% Medicaid or Medi-Cal in our hospital any given day. And so if you're a hospital-based physician, whether it be a hospitalist, emergency medicine, radiologist, pathologist, you were, you were you know, going to take care of who came in. Uh, and, and so that was very uh, eye-opening to at least uh, many of us on, in the organization leadership to see that data, really to point out that they were working well above the expected level of productivity, and they were paid well below the expected level of compensation. So it led to a revolving door of faculty uh, and, and really... Uh, a, a, a less than optimal culture, I'll say. But um, the structure is pretty simple. So the dyad model right there on the left-hand side uh, shows myself and Chad. Uh, and then below that is that committee I mentioned. It's about 15 people now. And we do have some rotation of the clinical leaders. And I, I say clinical leaders and not chairs because we have center directors, institute directors on there as well. Our cancer center director is a standing member. Uh, but then we have some chairs that rotate hospital-based, uh, ambulatory-based, and... and um, uh, uh, primary care based chairs that rotate uh, on that group uh, so we have representation and then below that shown on the right hand side as sur surrounding it are the five subcommittees where the real work gets done and similarly those five subcommittees are populated by clinical leaders and health system leaders at various levels and it's always a dyad model so we have co-chairs or two leaders there one from the health system one and it's really led to a very effective uh, uh, process and that's ambulatory operations, in case you can't read it, medical center operations, workforce planning, strategic opportunities, and, and quality, safety, and experience. And um, these are, you know, this committee, the CELC, and these subcommittees are not run by corporate executives looking at the bottom line. And that's an important concept. You notice finance is missing from here, isn't it? Because finance is not what drives our decisions or our process. Finances are what result from having a good process. And um, the evolution of this Clinical integration has led now within the last year for us to now have a common CFO for the entire enterprise. And we have a vice president of finance on each side uh, to manage because you can't actually blend the finances, even though we do conceptually. Uh, you literally can't do it, of course, for, for uh, lots of reasons. But it's important because these are uh, physicians on these committees looking to advance patient outcomes and safety, as, as are the health system leaders, as well as build a culture for their colleagues. So if you take a step back and we sort of think about why we, um, why we did this, the impetus was we wanted, this was seven and a half, almost eight years ago, we wanted to build something on our Irvine campus. It had long been a dream to have a hospital or health system on our campus here in Irvine because for the last 50 years, 52 years, we've been using a health system complex in Orange right by Disneyland. Uh, and that's 12 mile separation, which has made it you know, somewhat challenging, particularly when you try to get the researchers to work with the clinicians. Uh, and there's just a separation. The medical students would spend their first two years on the Irvine campus, second two years on that campus. You know, we've grown a lot over that time, but nevertheless, that was our dream was to have something. And at that time, we didn't dream that big. We said, well, let's build a cancer center in Irvine. And we realized uh, uh, 
uh, myself and the, and the then CEO, Rick Giannata, realized that in order to do that, we would have to go to at least 12 of our 20 clinical chairs and convince them to have their faculty come down here. And it would be, it was a decentralized system. We'd have to negotiate with 12 different people. Uh, by the time we got the negotiation done, we would have empty pockets and we would uh, have three years behind us and we would have lost the opportunity. So that was the impetus for creating the structure was to have a leadership team that made these decisions and, and endorsed them. And then financially, we put the money in there to fix those pay inequities and also to support the shortfall support that it would take to start up something like this. As it turns out, we then dreamed bigger and are now building an entire $1.3 billion health campus that is already two thirds open and the hospital will open next year. So exciting. Uh, we really uh, brought about competitive compensation, joint decision making and health equity because again, we didn't worry anymore about what the payments were or the collections were for those patients. We valued all of them equally based on a work RVU model and the entire system, the enterprise covered the, the dollar per work RVU that was gonna to go to the faculty to make sure everybody was valued equally. Uh, and that turns out to be really uh, important because we were ahead of the curve of that concept uh, uh, because of this process. So we also uh, had to change the model of the chairs because the chairs no longer were gonna be the same kind of a model. Uh, but we did so by making sure the chairs were behaving like chairs, not like busy faculty who happen to be asked to serve as a chair. And so their incentives are no longer productivity based for themselves. They might have some incentives for productivity of their department, but not for themselves. And their productivity and their incentives are based on succeeding as a chair, a leader, and, and interacting with the, with the enterprise. So it's been really great to have that decentralized to centralized structure go well. And you might imagine in the beginning it didn't go well. Out of our 20 clinical departments, there were about four that were violently opposed to it. Uh, but now over the last seven years, everybody recognizes the value because economically we have thrived, both the School of Medicine, the departments and the health system. So it's been great. Um, and just some, some data, uh, in fiscal year 24, we had a 96% physician retention rate. Out of our 24 overall departments, only 10 departments had separations of employment. Uh, at the end of fiscal year 24, we're in a major growth phase because we have to populate this new campus. We uh, had filled uh, almost 200 positions. And um, this year we're already 50% uh, into our year uh, goals, which by the way, the year just started July 1st. So we're already doing very well. Had an amazing uh, interest in, in all the positions that we, that we advertise. RN ratio, our, our RN turnover rate, sorry, has declined from 19% to just below 11% in 2024 over the last four years that went down. The national turnover rate is 18%. So uh, we're seeing success there as well. Our RN vacancy rate has been between two and 3%, well below the national average of 10%. So these are great statistics proving that I think when you focus on culture and people, uh, everyone uh, wants to be a part of that organization or stay a part of the organization. So I'm proud of that, uh, proud of those numbers, uh, but really at the end of the day, I think it leads to patient safety, which is the goal of all of our health systems, including our own. Um, but we know also that physicians are being asked to do more. Nurses are being asked to do more. And we're not oblivious to that fact. And so we're also trying to address uh, some of those uh, fundamental causes of the burnout. And really a systems oriented organizational level approach creating the enterprise has been fantastic. But I wanna make sure that we um, don't uh, mistake the fact that it's still a human behavior and human nature that drives some of the outcomes and you can't build in complete redundancy. And so I, I, I worry sometimes that when we talk about a systems approach or an algorithm approach, uh, uh, checking the boxes, if you would, uh, and those are all important, but they can't be by themselves. They have to be matched up with the culture and also individual, not just accountability, but individual performance. And so I'll give you an example. I was gonna show you a brief video, but I can't because I was too late submitting it and the CME police stopped me. Well, that group reports to me, so they did a good job, so that's right. Uh, so, so, cause it is UCI CME, but uh, it's a video of me when I was a resident. I happened to be a chief resident in 1990, and uh, there was a brand new reality TV show that was a, maybe the first one. It was called Rescue 911. William Shatner was the host, uh, and they came to Jackson Memorial, and my boss asked me to participate, so I mic'd up, and a fellow came in with a gunshot wound to the abdomen, wasn't, uh, he was not unstable, went to the OR. Uh, in the OR, I'm scrubbing, the, my, my boss said, hey, I'm gonna go to the bathroom, you know, he said it some other way, but he, uh, he went to the bathroom and I scrubbed in and I walked in the room and there was a crisis happening. The patient could not be intubated and they couldn't bag him. 
And this guy was shot while in a bar drinking is his usual activity of uh, the day. Uh, and he went to the defense of the bar owner who was being robbed and he got shot. And so um, long story short, I did an emergency cricothyroidotomy. Uh, and and I, when I see that video now, it's like that was not that uncommon in this environment where I was. Uh, and it wouldn't be that way today because we have different tools today. I recognize that. But nevertheless, everybody froze. They froze because they didn't expect this, right? And so I was asking for a tube. And if you ever want to go see the video, you can just Google uh, Rescue 911 uh, Miami Med Chopper. Miami Med Chopper. And you'll see that, that episode. And uh, it's kind of fun to look at it and see myself in, in those days. But everybody froze. And I kept, give me a tube. Give me a tube. Three times. And then at the end, I put the tube and I go, damn. Because I realized at that point, the adrenaline had come down. And I realized, oh, shit, they're videotaping me. You know? <laughs> so, but, but the point I want to make is that I, I didn't follow protocol. Right? You wouldn't, my worry is that that wouldn't happen today because we're so worried about respecting the anesthesiologist and getting, that we don't always understand that we have, to, we have to support that people will act in a way that may not follow protocol in a time of crisis. And we have to let them use their judgment to do that and support them. They have to defend themselves right, in the light of day. And the outcome's not always going to be perfect. But I think uh, Dr. Carmichael, our CMO, will recognize what I'm saying here and realize that we have to make sure we don't lose that element of patient, I'm sorry, physician judgment and decision making uh, in the context of everything has to be following protocol. So just one to that. So what we, you know, another memory is, uh, and I got my, my timing, thank you. I'm almost done here. Uh, when I was a resident, we had a different fear, right? Our fear wasn't of a lawyer. Our fear wasn't of the CMO telling us we did something wrong. Our fear was M&M. And I remember one of my chief residents when I was a, a, a third year, he had a saying, which is we go see a patient, incredibly complex, you know, this is a county hospital with very advanced disease often. And he would look at the patient and turn around to me and say, M&M for sure. <laughs> and that was the fear he would have, would be like, he knows he's going to be presenting this at m because this patient is not going to have a perfect outcome. And that's OK. We have to accept that that's OK. So um, what we created isn't perfect, no question about it. But I just want to give you a few uh, examples of some of our accolades here. I'm not going to read them, but just to point out uh, um, that um, we're, we're doing well, leapfrog egg raids, America's best hospitals, et cetera. And I think our future is bright. And uh, this is our new complex I talked about. Uh, and the building in the far background uh, is the only one that's not open yet. And that is our hospital that will be opening in uh, December of 2025. But the other buildings are all open. Uh, it is the only um, all electric hospital in the, in the, in the world. Uh, we've also opened up things like Office of Provider Experience, uh, a faculty peer support program. I think Don Berwick would have used that back in the day based on his talk yesterday, where we, we make sure that we have faculty peer supporters that are able to be turned to in the moment of crisis. You have a bad outcome. You made a mistake. A patient died. Any number of things you can turn to people, and, and they're there to help support and get you through those moments. So, so I think uh, we've, ho we've uh, invested in coaching for our physicians uh, not just our leaders, but all of our physicians. Everybody's gotten a chance to have three coaching sessions paid for by, uh, by, our, by my office. Uh, we have department wellness officers in all of our departments now uh, who are really focused on that. And so we're doing a lot of different things. We're using generative AI to help people with the EHR uh, in terms of drafting responses to patient messages, generating patient notes and event summaries, creating nursing shift and discharge summaries for the nurses. And then finally, we're going to Disneyland again. So last year, we took uh, 6,000 of our closest friends and colleagues to Disneyland. We rented the entire park for like 5 p.m. till 2 a.m. And we're doing it again this year, this time California Adventure. So those sorts of things help us build the culture. And um, finally, I'll just say that uh, UCI Health has been known as the safety net hospital for the underserved for more than 60 years. Uh, and some would see that as a negative. I talked about the percentage of Medicaid and Medi-Cal. We see it as a badge of honor. And it's our obligation to our community and our physicians, our health faculty, our nurses, and support staff stand behind our, our missions, including our pillar of health equity and the culture of wellness and happiness that we continue to build on every day. So thank you for your time this morning. I look forward to the continued discussion as we all drive towards uh, a safer environment for our patients and try to get to zero deaths. Thank you.